the MEC for infrastructure. Uh, so, and of course, we have Pros, Pros Milado, a member of the Premier's uh, COVID-19 Advisory Committee, who will start, and then um, we will we'll then have uh, the uh, vaccination program, up, the update on the vaccination program, and we will also deal with uh, some of the health uh, response uh, issues. As you know, the second wave, I mean, the third wave is here, and we have to deal with that. So we will, in our presentations, also take you through what are the steps that we are taking to ensure that uh, we manage to go through this uh, third wave uh, together safely. Uh, without any further waste of time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Bruce Milado to come and uh, start the presentation, and then the next ones will follow. Was I controlling from there? Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Premier DG uh, MECs. Uh, I will be speaking on behalf of the uh, Premier COVID-19 Advisory Committee and I will give you an overview of all the numbers to date and analytics to date that speak to the fact that we are solidly in a third wave, in a third resurgence. Uh, what you see there in the upper graph is the number of daily occurrences. Where you see the historical perspective of the first, second, and now third wave. We are technically in the middle of a resurgence. This is the fifth week of sustained growth in the number of cases. And as a matter of fact, in the past two days, we've had about 3,000 cases a day, which is already quite a big number. Now, these are data occurrences. We can look at the lower graph where we average over a week. And you can see in the past four weeks, we've seen the first week of the resurgence with a 63% increase with respect to the previous week. 57, 47, four, uh, and, and 40 percent, that basically means that we have a sustained acceleration in uh, the numbers. The numbers are going to become large, and we expect the numbers to keep growing all through uh, June. Next, please. We have a different statistic here. We've got the number of uh, officially deceased due to COVID-19. As you can see, the daily occurrences you clearly see a, uh, an increase in the number of people deceased. Uh, uh, as recorded uh, to be due to COVID-19. Uh, that's the daily occurrences. You can look at the graph below. That is the weekly fatalities. When you integrate your sum over a week, you can see clearly that there is a continued growth in the number of fatalities. Let's go next. Uh, you can also look at the number of fatalities from a different standpoint. These numbers are reported by the MRC. This is what people refer to as the excess mortality in the province uh, up until May 29th. Well, you can see there on the blue curve uh, talks about the excess mortality, the total possible mortality with respect to previous years um, that is, uh, continues to grow. And you can compare that with the red curve, which is the officially recorded COVID-19 mortalities, where you can see both are independent statistics that indicate growth in the number of uh, fatalities in the province. Let's go next, please. Um, this graph is a bit busy, but I will I'll walk you through it. These are the number of hospitalizations for different uh, districts in uh, uh, weekly. Uh, and what you can see there is now uh, the number of hospitalizations have gr has grown significantly. The last week, the downtick is not a real downtick. It has to do with the way statistics are collected. So we have basically sustained growth in the number of hospitalizations as well, which is an independent uh, metric uh, that speaks to the fact that we are in the middle of a resurgence. Can we go next? Uh, another important uh, uh, independent metric 
is uh, the positivity rate. You can see there uh, uh, the historical data. You see the second wave, the positivity rate uh, goes down in the interim period between the second and the third wave. Now we are seeing that the number of uh, positives are now growing. The uh, positivity rate or the fraction of, uh, of people that test positive to all tests ha has been growing steadily and has passed the 10% rate, which is a metric that speaks to the fact that we are also in the med middle of a resurgence. Let's go next. Mobility is extremely important. Mobility is one of the drivers for uh, the virus to move around in the province. You will see now in few slides from now how the virus is, is spreading in different districts and sub-districts. And uh, if you look at this graph, these graphs come from Google. Let's focus on the red one. You can clearly see that despite this minor uptick uh, about a week ago, overall the mobility is very similar to the mobility we had right before the second wave and it's been among the highest after the hard lockdown uh, last year. So this basically means that mobility is quite high in the province and that obviously makes us very worried that uh, the numbers will continue to grow because people continue to move, people continue to interact. Let's go next. Uh, that was Google data. This is uh, now Facebook data that allows us to look uh, at the level of districts. You see there the mobility in the city of Johannesburg, city of Tswane, Ikuruleni, and City Bank. Uh, if you look at the dark blue curve, this, as you've seen with the Google data, a slight downtick in mobility, but very small compared to the big picture. And overall, mobility is quite high in the province in all uh, the districts of the province. Let's go next. Uh, the hotspot analysis is very important because not only do we look at all the numbers, uh, we have to look at where the numbers are and how they are growing and are they creating clusters or hotspots. So this is the situation uh, using the IBM viewer uh, of uh, the clusters in the province so far as of uh, the 2nd of June. Uh, we have current, have currently have 16 hotspots with more than 100 cases. Um, for, uh, up from 11 the week prior. So we also see the sustained growth in the number of clusters. We have uh, three main groups in the city of Tswane. Most of the uh, uh, clusters right now, hotspots are in fact in the city of Johannesburg, but we also have a, a cluster of hotspots in Ferenikin. Uh, can we go next? Um, we provide to the population and policymakers an index that speaks to the severity of these hotspots, how dangerous they are. And if the number is above 20, that means that the hotspot is growing very, very fast and is engulfing a uh, neighboring hotspot. That's a very dangerous one. So far, none of them pass that index, but the number of hotspots uh, is growing. Let's go next. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is one of the most active hotspots we've got right now, which is in the... Uh, Pretoria uh, region, and uh, you also have the number of the uh, number of the uh, cases compared to the epidemiological curve, indicating that there is an, an, an uptick in the number of cases attached to that uh, hotspot. Next one uh, is a hotspot in Krugersdorp that shows a similar behavior with uh, an acceleration in recent uh, couple of weeks in the number of cases assigned to that hotspot. Next one, please. Now we're going to talk about risk indexes. These indexes basically tell us how serious the situation is. Are we in high risk or medium risk or low risk? So we look at the map of uh, uh, the risk indexes of South Africa, the interactive map there. We basically clearly see that provinces such as uh, the Free State or the Northern Cape or the Northwest are solidly in a third way. You can clearly see from those curves that are, you, you have there. But also provinces like in Pumalanga and in Popa are also uh, undergoing an increase in the number of cases and their risk is also approaching medium to high. Uh, let's go next. If we look at the situation in the province, it's very important to look at what happens at the level of districts and sub-districts. What you see there is that Citibank uh, uh, continues to be in the high risk uh, area uh, with um, some uh, significant acceleration in the, uh, in the risk, but not only a city bank because of the mobility that cast, people move around, the virus is moving around us, and then what we see is that the numbers are also increasing elsewhere. The risk is increasing across the board, uh, especially in Swanee and Johannesburg. Let's go next. Uh, if we zoom in to the uh, city bank sub-districts, we see there that Midfall uh, is experiencing significant acceleration, is solidly in the high-risk 
area, but also the other two sub-districts, Enfuleni and the city, are also uh, experiencing acceleration and they are in the high risk area as well. Um, when you look deeper into the uh, Johannesburg, Swane, and Ikuruleni sub-districts, you can see that some sub-districts are experiencing more acceleration than others, but overall, all the sub-districts and most of the sub-districts are experiencing uh, a, a growth in the risk indexes approaching medium to high, um, pretty much almost across the board uh, for all sub-districts. Uh, and I will, uh, in closing, uh, show a snapshot of what our risk index, the overall risk index of the province uh, using artificial intelligence. All the data together, everything that I in perspective, you see there the uh, red curve, which is system of the of risk for about two weeks about the uh, high risk uh, in the high risk uh, region in Houting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, we will now have uh, Mr. Malotana. Lisiva Malotana, the acting uh, head of Department of Health, to speak about what we are to ensure that we are all safe as we go through this uh, third wave. Uh, members of the media presentation being loaded. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to a certain principles that we, we've always followed as a, as a province. We, we've always had and agreed that there are three uh, principles that we work with. Currently, of course, with where we are in the pandemic, it's the speed at which we can vaccinate the number of people against the, the, the of course, the second part, which I'll be talking about, the management of the recession, which is about how do we suppress the infection, and lastly, the management of or more reduction of morbidity and mortality. That's the issues about the hospital administration, administration and, of course, people being discharged alive. I would not repeat, uh, I will skip a quite a fair amount of slides in the presentation. If we move, these principles are known. The national picture in terms of where with the pandemic is also known. I would want to just to demonstrate in terms of the, the active cases in the province, the positive, the recoveries and the mortalities that of course we are, as per Professor Melado confirmed, we are in the third wave and we are at the peak in the last uh, um, uh, seven days. Of course, we, we've seen the, the resurgence in numbers on average over 2,000 daily infections recorded and that's cause for concern. And of course, that's what will informed uh, um, a national command council to adjust the level down the lockdown levels if we move to the next slides it just also breaks down in terms of the active cases and uh, against the, the 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 recoveries that we have in the province i think one of the issues we always re recommend is that the province has highest, highest number of recoveries with the lowest number of mortality and something that we remain commendable. We could go to, um, to this, uh, of course, the daily infections, Prof made reference to it, what we are demonstrating that in, in the last week of the seven days, of course, we, we, with the 15,291 cases recorded over the seven days, it's quite something alarming, it's something cause for concern, and the pockets that Prof Melado made references to are cause for concern. If we move, this, of course, the really dollar average, on, on daily basis, it just shows you that we are still lower than where we were at the first, at the first and the second wave, and we hopefully, with the capacity that we have in the system, that we should the, the third wave should not be uh, worse than the previous. If we move to the next slide, this is just, of course, the regional breakdown, confirming the total number of cases that we have totally in the province. 
having uh, 4, uh, 465,000 active cases, maybe noticeably that we've surpassed 11,000 in terms of the recorded deaths. But we are we always hopefully in terms of the, the 15,000 uh, seven day average remains a cause for concern for us and that requires the citizens to be actively informed. That's the low level of details. I will not talk to the uh, Professor Melado graphically demonstrated the pockets of concern. Maybe safe to say, of course, Johannesburg Region B, C, D, and E, and Tswan Region 3, 4, and 6, and Ikurileni N1 and 2, and parts of Merafom are cause for concern for us because those are the pockets of the recent pressures in the, past, in the past 7 to 14 days, and we require that the citizens also pay particular attention and adjust the behavior in those areas. We can move. Here's the data t details. Maybe safe to say Gauteng as a province, of course, we contribute 32% of the total number of daily tests that gets done in the country. Uh, and that's a reflection of the, the size of the population and then of our participation in terms of the infection. Uh, Gauteng remains the highest. The breakdown in terms of the contract tracing, the work that continues to be done there, it's, it's, it's the work that we continue to do and it's something that's commendable. We are just worried about the case to contact ratio that's starting to increase, meaning that, as Prof said, the, the people are moving, the virus then follows people. We can move. The management of patients, I'll just uh, talk to the principal. Currently, relative to where we are, even compared to the first and the second wave, our hospital admissions remains low. Whilst the, uh, in the past seven days, there has been a bit of slight increase in terms of those patients. Most of our patients are remain in private health. We are sitting 753 patients in public health services. And compared to the total number of beds that we've created, we remain comfortable that we should not surpass. Maybe the point that you need to make that even in the first and the second wave, we have never passed 3,000 admissions. And we are far away from that as far as content in terms of the, uh, the patients that we see in the system. If we move, this is just, of course, a demonstration, a graphics a presentation of what Prof demonstrated. This just shows you that our admission and that there were sharp increases. There's a relationship between increase in the infection and increase in the admission, and that's really what is demonstrated. We can move. Really, this is what I wanted to talk to, and I will not necessarily get into, into to, 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 to the major detail. What we are saying is that between the first, second, and third wave, the province continuously increased the number of beds that we have in the system. And over and above, and because one of the issues is that, of course, we are aware that we have lost Charlotte Matlega currently. However, there are beds that have been created in the system. Angulo Ashanti had come in, Bronco Sprite, the ABT in Jubilee, and Barra are also come into place. And what we are saying is that the total number of bed capacity created in the province assures us of the capacity we have and we remain confident in terms of how we're going to be managing the second, the third wave as where we are. We can move. The point we are making in summary is literally said that for the first wave and what I'm trying to demonstrate there, that there's a continuous increase even with the reduction of the current bed capacity that we, we've lost, we've created additional capacity more. But also we are advised by public health experts that given that there is a process of, of course, acquired community immunity, and the, the vaccination rollout, this, the, the peak of the third wave should not be as bad as first and second. And that's the principle. And that's also continue to assure us in terms of where we are. Maybe just to deal in, in summary, given the, the time limit without repeating what the professor said, I just want to confirm that over and above the bed capacity, we have been able to have a funding allocated to support the staff. We have 1.85 billion allocated for the staffing. And in that 1.58 billion, we have been able to fill 5,521 posts at the 1st of July. And all those posts are posts that are now available for us to, to face and confront the third wave as part of the... And the breakdown is, of course, the 1.5 billion towards the temporary appointments. And there's money allocated for nursing agencies, say 50 million. There's 43 million for data improvement and data um, management. And of course, there's also 44 million that is being uh, directed specifically to hire and employ people for vaccination projects. That the details of the vaccination rollout will then be presented. Maybe in a nutshell, that's where we are as a province, and we maybe just want to ask the citizens of the province to, of course, be cognizant that we are not out of the woods. We are still under pressure. We are where we are with the pandemic, and we will want uh, everybody else to comply with the non-pharmaceutical interventions that are being advocated. Thanks, Chair.
Thank you. Uh, that was Lisiba Malotana. I saw in uh, uh, one of the um, media reports, uh, my face was put uh, under Lisiba Malotana. So my name is Tavo Masebe. That is Lisiba Malotana. Um, okay, um, we now will call um, Mrs. Nom Sam Mupe to come and uh, talk to us about the vaccination rollout program. <laughs> I'm, I'm told that uh, one day they actually introduced her uh, as the MEC. <laughs> okay, Ms. Mupe. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Premier, and good morning to MECs, my colleagues and members of the media. Uh, my presentation today will be very short because it's just an update of where we are since we launched the vaccination program from the 17th of February. And then we moved over to launch phase two of the vaccination program on the 17th of May. So I will be focusing mainly on phase two of the vaccination program. So in total, since uh, the start of the rollout in phase two, we received just over 196,000 Pfizer vaccines to vaccinate. So yesterday, we, we received an additional 71,370 vaccines, part of continuation of the program, and we will be receiving the remainder, which is just above 58,000 vaccines this afternoon, as part of the 133,000 doses we're supposed to receive for this week. And as of the 17th of May, we have uh, administered just over 209,000 vaccines since the start of phase two rollout. And of this number, 149,000 uh, are persons that are above the age of 60 and close to 60,000 are healthcare workers. So in total, we have vaccinated 328,000 in Gauteng uh, on the vaccination program. I must emphasize the fact that Gauteng, since the start of the vaccination program, has been leading all other provinces in the number of people that we are vaccinating. We have, at some point, Premier did hear that case again let us know. Gauteng has always been on the lead. We do our best to get as many people as possible to vaccinate. So we have just above 488,000 that we have registered on the EVDS. This continues to be our biggest challenge to get people to, to register on the program. But I also want to reiterate the position that Gauteng has taken that we do not turn anyone away when they arrive at the vaccination site. Whether they are registered or not, we accept them, we assist them to register and we vaccinate them. That's the decision we took under the leadership of our Premier, and this has been the case. So this next slide that is uh, flighted here basically just shows where we are when we compare ourselves to other provinces. And as I indicated, we have just done just over 328,820 uh, people since the beginning of the vaccine rollout program. The next slide. So if you disaggregate it, if you want to have a look at how we fed in terms of vaccinating uh, the healthcare workers, we're doing relatively well. We've done 87% uh, of the total population that we had targeted. Remember when I did the first media briefing, I did indicate that we have a total of 215,801 healthcare workers that we have to vaccinate uh, through this program. We've done relatively well because we've managed so far to cover 87% and the remainder, which is uh, the 28,000 and odd number, we should be completing it by the end of next week. Next slide. In terms of the people that are over uh, the ages of 60, our total target is over just over 1.3 million. And to date, we, as I said, we vaccinated close to 150,000. And you can see how all the districts have fed. Obviously, Johannesburg will lead because that's where the biggest numbers are. And the private sector is also 
uh, making a big contribution to the vaccination program. They're sitting at 49,330 people they're vaccinated that are above the age of 60. Next slide. In terms of uh, people that are in old age homes or uh, long-term care facilities, this is an area that we, we pride ourselves in having pushed and made sure that the people that are most vulnerable are vaccinated. We have got 218 old age homes that we had targeted and to date we had covered 99 of those and the population in all the 218 is 26,216 people that live in these facilities and we've done 17,723 and in the next week we should be completing the 18,830. So the next, uh, I think, two, two, three slides will show uh, the, the vaccination sites per district. Uh, I'm sure members of the media don't see this for the first time because we have been publishing them in the various media and communication platforms available to us in Gauteng as well as the National Department of Health. So in summary, the program provides the best chance of reducing new infections, severe illness, hospitalization and death. We urge more residents who are above the age of 60 to register for the vaccination program because the more people we get vaccinated for COVID, the more we'll get closer to the end of the pandemic. We'll also like to thank the general public for their patience and support during the rollout program. Next slide, please. So since the start of the vaccination program, we have seen a steady increase in the uptake of the vaccine. We currently have about 103 sites with 63 being public and 40 being in the private sector that operate and ramp up the numbers of those people that we vaccinate. We also continue to encourage people to register on the system so that they are vaccinated. And at the same time, we'll ensure that all the sites make adequate plans for weapons. Uh, will, as I indicated, will not turn anyone away from the vaccination sites. And our community workers are really assisting the elderly in their homes and other settings to ensure that they are registered on the system. Also, our call center is also supporting and registering people and directing them to their nearest vaccination sites where possible. Uh, this is the hotline, and I think I did present this in the last media briefing, and most of us are aware of it. Next slide. I think I would like to end here. Thank you, Premier. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Mope. Uh, Dr. Maseko. Dr. Maseko will come and speak to us about what we are doing to manage some of the problems that we're having. As you know, we have a, a, cry, a water crisis affecting some of the hospitals. Uh, resulting from the uh, work that was done by um, Rent Water and uh, Jobek Water. But uh, Dr. Maseko will come and talk to us about what we are doing to manage that situation. He will also update us on where we are with regard to the reopening of the Charlotte Matreke uh, Johannesburg Academic Hospital. Thank you, Tichi. Good morning, Premier, MSs, uh, colleagues, and members of the media. <clears throat> Let me start with uh, maybe updating in terms of the water challenges that uh, our uh, service platform has experienced uh, over the past uh, two weeks. Uh, as we all know that uh, we are probably one of the biggest consumers uh, uh, of, of, of water, but it also becomes an important uh, requirements for, for us uh, in, in the service platform. And that is why it's, it's very important that uh, we then have strategic uh, alliances with our suppliers of water, which does exist. And uh, from time to time, we do meet and then engage in terms of that. But also as and when they also uh, 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 try and improve on the water infrastructure, uh, we are also always given priority. Uh, as uh, uh, facilities. As an example, is Barra is supplied directly by rainwater as a reserve uh, line, uh, uh, but also by a city of Jobek. 
so it, as and when the city of Jobek does maintenance, then we are able to. So there is, a, 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 from a risk mitigation point, there is a, 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 that we are comfortable that we had really been able to just engage and ensure that uh, we do have those kinds of supplies. Be as it may, when we then receive the water from the uh, uh, municipality, we also have got reservoir tanks uh, that uh, uh, are there so that they can be able to hold uh, uh, when we have uh, it's uh, the capacity of the tanks and uh, with also in terms of the increase of the uh, service platform it's uh, uh, it can only hold us at some facilities from about six hours and in some facilities 24 hours so what then it says it says when we have a, a water challenge that goes beyond certain hours then we will be able to then run out of, of, of it but we do have uh, uh, then water tankers that are made available immediately when we've got uh, uh, challenges with it. And this is supplied both by the South Jobek, but also through our in, in implementing agent, which is infrastructure, which then uh, is able to procure within that. But you can then understand that uh, if you have a reservoir like Helen Joseph of 260,000 liters of water and the water tank has got 10,000, it means you need to have uh, uh, about at least minimum of 26 of them being able to come and supply and replenish that water. And the consumption in our facilities, uh, the smaller facilities ranges from about uh, 50,000 uh, uh, liters per day. And that the Helen Joseph in particular, it's 750,000 liters. And at Rahim Amosa, it's 100,000 liters per day, the consumption. Uh, therefore, you really need to ensure that at least the tanks we've got in terms of that. So what, having realized that uh, this uh, now uh, is uh, uh, becoming a, a, a challenge and uh, affects the services and also looking at the high rise of our buildings, uh, the department in conjunction with also the infrastructure and also uh, 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 through EXCO is really embarking on just ensuring that at least we do have in terms of enough water tankers that we can have so that it becomes at least a meaningful backup that is then able to uh, uh, come in when uh, our reservoirs uh, uh, are, are then running dry so that then we are able to. Yes, we are also looking at uh, 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 where a uh, 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 law permits uh, in, in terms of also having a, another supply, uh, boreholes, uh, some of our facilities have got uh, uh, boreholes, but now we're also looking at that and just ensuring that at least we're we are able to uh, ensure that we keep that uh, supply uh, constant towards the That's really then plan to risk mitigate uh, in terms of just ensuring that this critical uh, Uh, Charlotte is, uh, is, is then content is serious engagements with the city just in ensuring that uh, the new regulations that have been applied that when our facilities were built, uh, it was not we have uh, 